Welcome everybody. Uh, I am Jean-Claude Ramirez and I'm the managing partner for South America of Bain & Company, which is a global strategic uh, consulting firm. I'm delighted to be here today uh, moderating a panel with this group of distinguished uh, speakers on a topic that is so relevant to Latin America. Um, let me give you just the context of this issue briefing, um, which is the following. We all know that e-commerce is a growing force in global trade. Uh, it has enabled large enterprises such as Amazon and Alibaba to expand with tremendous success their trade horizons beyond their original countries, the US and China. Okay? Moreover, e-commerce is also has the potential to give access to these same global markets to micro, small, and medium businesses in disadvantaged, disadvantaged regions of the world, such as Latin America, the interior of China, etc. cetera. In, in doing so, would also expand the choice for consumers globally. So to make this inclusive growth a reality, reforms to industry practices and government policies are needed in order to provide an enabling environment. Today, there are a series of barriers that must be overcome for these MSMEs uh, in order to, for them to be able to participate in, uh, in cross-border trade via e-commerce. These barriers, as you can imagine, include things such as e-payments, delivery logistics, international returns, data protection, fraud prevention, trust, you get the idea. So there, there, there's a series of, of barriers uh, that are not necessarily just tariffs and things of that nature that, that actually will, you know, are, need to be overcome. So in this session, we have a unique opportunity to get insights into what I think is one key question. And the question is, what are possible solutions to overcome these barriers? And what type of collaboration, coordination, and technology needs to be set up in order to drive inclusive growth of small businesses in cross-border markets via e-commerce in Latin America and other disadvantaged regions of the world. I know it's a, it's a mouthful, but you know, that's, I, I think that's the, that sums up the, the key question. So to touch briefly on these issues, we have a wonderful set of panelists. Uh, we have Ambassador Demetrius Marantis, which I'm going to call Demetrius from now on, but you know, he's an ambassador. He's the senior vice president of global government relations for Visa. We have Roberto Azevedo, which is uh, the director general of the WTO, the World Trade uh, Organization. And to my left, we have Jeff Kraft, uh, the general manager of Amazon.com for Latin America, Canada, and the Caribbean. So thank you all for being here. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have a brief conversation for about, I don't know, 15 minutes, hopefully followed by a good 10 minutes of Q&A with the audience, and uh, time permitting, maybe we can have some uh, closing remarks. And I'm going to set the stage by asking each one of you a specific question so we can cover different angles of, uh, of this equation. So I wanted to direct my first question to uh, Roberto. And, uh, and the question is, why is making global trade more inclusive by creating e-commerce opportunities for these micro, small, and medium enterprises in places like LATAM? And why is this important to the World Trade Organization? Well, well e-commerce in general is important to the World, uh, World Trade Organization because we are in 2018. And uh, this is a reality of today's world. So it has to be important, number one. Um, number two, the volume is growing so fast, so quickly, it's so big. In 2015, we had $22 trillion uh, dollars in, in, in e-commerce. Uh, and just in that two-year period from 2013 to 2015, it grew by 38%. And that rate of expansion is keeping up. Um, and if we don't do anything, if we just let things go uh, by their own devices, uh, the small and medium enterprises are going to be left behind. Uh, it will be completely dominated by the big companies because the, the number of obstacles, the number of uh, challenges for the small and medium enterprises to participate is, is huge. And for them, while for a big company this is just another cost on the spreadsheet, for them it's probably a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to figure out what we can do. 
you mentioned uh, several issues. I think the bigger problem we have today when we sit at the WTO or any other meeting about e-commerce, when we sit around the table, we had that in Davos, we were together in a session. Um, the, the most difficult part is understand what are we talking about? Because each person thinks about e-commerce in a different way. Uh, he thinks about a different set of problems. So even defining the agenda uh, is complicated. And I'm happy to say that now in the WTO, people are doing precisely that. They are trying to set up an agenda. They are trying to decide what are the challenges, which are the priorities. You can't do everything, but which are the, the, the topics that deserve a priority attention from the organization? What are the things that we can do to help? Um, and the focus is helping the small and medium enterprises. In many countries, in most countries, they account for two-thirds and up to 90% of the workforce. Um, they need to be included. Thank you. Um, Demetrios, uh, you've had a long and, and distinguished career as a trade representative for the US. Based on your experience, what do you see as the key challenge for cross-border e-commerce that hinders inclusive growth? And in, in, if possible, what do you think are possible solutions? Sure, thank you. Um, so, so I work at Visa now, and we're a payments technology company. And you know, what we do in, in large part is we uh, connect you know, 3 billion uh, accounts with 44 million merchants in 200 countries and territories. And e-commerce and digital payments is really at the heart of, of what we do as a company. Um, it's interesting, in 2016, digital payments eclipsed cash for the very first time globally in terms of how people pay. And it's indicative of, of how um, e-commerce is really just exploding. And what's most interesting from sort of the perspective of what governments should and should not be doing is for many years, e-commerce grew and boomed um, in a largely permissionless environment. Governments weren't really doing much, um, and that's changed, and I think we're at an inflection point, and this is where the WTO, I think, can be extraordinarily helpful. Governments are intervening now in this space. In some ways, it's very helpful. They're providing an enabling environment to allow e-commerce to flourish. In other areas, governments are doing things that are actually um, putting the brakes on, on innovation and are doing things that won't necessarily help e-commerce. So this is where the WTO can play a role, is to put guardrails around what governments are doing in order to ensure that the growth of e-commerce continues in a way that you said. It's inclusive, it's sustainable, um, it's secure, and, it, it, and it's done so in a way that promotes innovation. So thinking about this, I think there are five principles um, that governments should follow. Um, one is ensure technology neutrality. None of us, governments in particular, can predict the future. And so no one should mandate the use of a particular technology. When a government decides to regulate, it should set a principle, it should set a goal, and let the private sector figure out the best technology and develop the best technology to achieve that goal. So that's principle one. Principle two is to ensure a level playing field. Um, and in geeky trade speak that Roberto and I speak well, um, that's ensuring national treatment. So we're seeing today all around the world instances where governments are deciding, it's sort of back to the future, they're creating national champions in this space and they're creating an unlevel playing field and are making it very challenging for um, international competitors to compete in a local market. That's bad, that stymies competition and that makes it worse for local merchants, for local small businesses and, and for local consumers. So ensuring a level playing field is critical. Um, the third key principle um, is to ensure interoperability. E-commerce, digital commerce, it relies on open architecture. If you are, if, if a government is going to, um, again, mandate a particular standard that's a closed loop system or that's not interoperable with global standards, it just makes things more difficult for small and medium sized businesses to comply with. So interoperability is key. The fourth is something that we're all very familiar with, um, which is the obvious, is governments have to ensure the free flow of data across borders. 
again, the digital economy relies on data. Without data, if, if you're, if you're going to close off your economy to data, you're essentially, that's akin to sealing off your economy um, from global commerce. This is such an obvious point, but in trade negotiations, oftentimes, it's something that's used as a bargaining chip. Um, and you know, companies, whether they're big companies or small companies, need to ensure that their data is able to flow freely across borders. The fifth and final principle is um, there's been a trend for data localization where governments are requiring that, um, that, that companies locate a server in their particular jurisdiction. That's not great. Innovation and nationalism don't mix. Um, and in order to ensure, again, the free flow of data and that e-commerce um, is transacted as smoothly and as easily as possible, data localization policies are things that we really should work to limit. So sorry about going on for so long, but those are, the, I think, the five main things that if I were advising Roberto on what the WTO should work with governments to do, I think those are the five things that would be um, really game-changing in this space. Thank you. And that was a very comprehensive uh, answer. That was great. Um, Jeff, you're next. You're next. Um, what can private sector companies like Amazon.com do to make e-commerce easier uh, for MSMEs uh, in places like Latin America or in, in what type of collaboration with governments would be required? Yeah, great question. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to be up here. And thank you all for staying for the, out a very full day uh, and joining us here at the end of the day uh, for this session. Um, I would say right now, there is no better time to be a small business or a startup community ever. It is just the market conditions, the technologies, the principles that are just articulated are terrific. This is the time for so many different organizations to really grow quickly. And what we're finding in small businesses and startups and more, really going through two big shifts. One is a mental shift of, I never thought I could sell my painting to someone in Seattle, Washington, but I live here in Sao Paulo, to how do I get there? And it's a shift both mentally as well as then practically going ahead and thinking about, well, how in the world would I go ahead and do this as a part of that? Um, at Amazon, we go ahead and start with the customer and work our way backwards from that. That has forever been our premise by which we go ahead and guide what we do while thinking very long term. To that end, it's the guidance that we also work with many small businesses. Start first with what do you want to go ahead and accomplish and work your way backwards. If you want to sell globally, how are you thinking about doing that? What's the steps and the processes all the way through? And we've worked with many small businesses and startups to whiteboard that journey. So if they do aspirationally want to sell in another country, globally, or even out of their jurisdiction, just what are the logistics and the elements all the way through that they have to think about so they don't start a path that they have to change or rapidly impact their business. Um, as we work with governments, we go ahead and work on many of the same principles that are just articulated to help expedite those type of artisans, for instance, that want to sell their wares. Um, in Chile, we ran a pilot with the government, phenomenal pilot, where they, we loaded up container loads of artisan products that had been made, and we did ship it to Seattle, Washington, and we put it up on Amazon.com. Um, they sold out just like that. Now, what was neat out of that um, experiment, one that we're continuing on, um, is artisans got to be artisans. They didn't have to learn how to be focused on logistics. They didn't have to learn how to think about um, currency fluctuations going across or how to market. We have a whole section on our retail side called Fulfillment by Amazon, where artisans or other small businesses can either publish their wares and have the orders directly uh, directed to them. They can go ahead and fulfill to where they actually ship it to our fulfillment centers and we fulfill in a day or two days, for instance, through Amazon Prime or other activities a host of different ways that we're working with small businesses to expand their success. In the startup side, it's an even more exciting part for me. Um, that part is exciting because I see startups specifically here in Brazil. 
go ahead and take their solutions globally. In a matter of minutes, they can deploy an application that they've built for their smartphone to Portugal, to Spain, to the United States, to Australia, rather rapidly. Take the phenomenal success of 99 Taxis. Started here. Now they're available throughout m many Latin American countries. Um, and from that, they are able to deploy quickly and expand out their commerce activities more rapidly. And then we've got a product called AWS Marketplace, 2,000 different solutions now. And we're seeing from Latin America in particular, and interestingly enough, quite a few from here in Sao Paulo. An interesting trivia part, this outside of the United States, the two cities that have the biggest concentration of developers writing for the mobile platform, all of our Android and iPhones applications, is Mexico City and Sao Paulo. And it's growing like wildfire. The innovation is here. So when we think about commerce, we think about not only goods and, that have to be yeah, physically sure. moved, but also the digital commerce as well yeah. that occurs. Um, nobody talked about um, uh, infrastructure. Is that is is that a concern, or or it's you know less in you know it, it's a lesser concern in the in the scale of uh, you know of other issues? I'm thinking of access to you know broadband, uh, you know uh, uh, good roads, you know to go and and, 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 and you know get the, get the goods and those kinds of things. From the digital side, we have um, what we've actually been able to see now is customers, especially small businesses, loving the opportunity to leverage cloud services in a pay-as-you-go type of model. And so the infrastructure is there. Now we're seeing the infrastructure to go global rapidly um, be expanded out through infrastructure developments within countries, mobile broadband being the fastest one that's occurring. Um, and we continue to see throughout Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, um, if anyone's traveled lately to Colombia, they've moved from having two internet pipes to now having seven internet pipes. And there's times in Medellin and Cali, I get better, faster connection than being outside of Portland, Oregon mm -hmm. as a part. Yeah. So we're seeing that continue yeah. on, the, um, on that perspective yeah. very rapidly. And Roberto, oh. No, I was just going to say yeah. just an example on, on the logistics side from, from the perspective of payments um, and how some of the principles that are, I articulated play into that. So uh, one of the logistics that you need, that merchants oftentimes need to, make a, to accept payments is a point of sale terminal. And those can be expensive. And so what we've done is we've developed a QR-based um, way for merchants to accept payments that they could do it on their phone. So they don't have to invest in a, an expensive POS terminal. Um, but if Visa has one um, QR code you know, system, MasterCard has another, someone else has another, someone else has another, it makes it, 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 it eviscerates all of the, the benefits that you get from um, having you know, a, an easy, simple, cheap way to accept payments. So we worked to develop an interoperable QR code so that a merchant doesn't have to worry if you know, he or she is accepting a payment from Visa or from uh, some, someone else. And in Argentina recently, they, they just approved um, this interoperable QR code-based system, which is going to reduce costs significantly for small and medium-sized merchants so that they're going to be able to accept um, digital payments. So it's an example of how how the principle of interoperability helps to reduce costs for small and medium-sized businesses by allowing them to benefit from the most recent innovation. Robert, I was going to ask, do, does, does the WTO, uh, it, it, what role does it play in terms of trying to coordinate right, the, these efforts? Because we're saying you know, we have standard issues, we have things that involve government, things that involve the, the private sector. Uh, and uh, one option is just basically let the private sector figure it out, you know, and then each, each company negotiate with governments what they need, or is there a, is there a more holistic... Uh, well, the, the, pri the private sector has a very important role to play because governments, frankly, uh, they don't have a clue about what's going on in the digital world. That's the reality, and I'm saying that I was government too. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that's the reality. So the private sector has to illustrate, educate governments in general. Uh, in the WTO, the conversation goes to a much deeper level. Uh, 
so now we have these conversations uh, going on with uh, um, around 80 countries already sitting down around the table. And clearly, one issue that we have is connectivity. Uh, so infrastructure is absolutely mm -hmm. fundamental. Half the world population is not connected. Yeah, okay. It's not online. Yeah. So that is something that we have to address. Uh, I get many countries there in the WTO, small economists, who say, well, we're talking about e-commerce and the digital world. We barely have electricity. So how, how, do, how mm -hmm. do we fix that? And I think that's, that's clearly a challenge. A challenge right? uh, but what is important to bear in mind is that it's connectivity alone is not going to do the trick. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to have the right regulatory environment. You have to have the right laws, the right regulations, an enabling environment, which is something that Jeff was talking about. Let me give you one, just one example. Uh, in several countries, in several countries, um, the regulations, for example, don't allow for the return of the merchandise. Yep. So you export a T-shirt to another country, the, the person tries on the T-shirt, and the T-shirt doesn't fit. So he wants to change for a bigger size or a smaller size or whatever. So he wants to return the merchandise. He cannot because the regulations of the country don't allow the, the, the product to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, it is treated as a new import. Yep. So it, it just kills uh, entirely the export potential of okay. several sectors yeah. of the economy. So you have to have both things, the soft infrastructure and the hard infrastructure. One alone is not going to do it. If I can just piggyback yeah. off of that, I think one of the biggest challenges we all face is helping uh, governments understand what can be done and the impact on policy mm. efforts right now. Mm. Uh, so many of the laws are uh, predate what technology now can go ahead and do. And it's up to the private industry in conjunction with organizations such as yours to really help educate and inform government so that it, as they are going ahead in either changing legislation or presenting new legislation, they're not hurting the small business. They're not hurting and killing the innovation out of startup communities and more. And that's a core responsibility, I think, private communities uh, bear. Okay. I would just imagine that when I think of you know big business potentially killing small business, that there is, you know, as a you know as a platform like like Amazon, I, I think I would probably want to offer as, as much variety as possible to to my customers, right? So that there is also an intrinsic need, you know, to uh, to get this diversity of, of products, right? I mean, there is, right versus just having you know a few things that are that look the same versus yeah. unique unique, uh, unique pieces. Well, and that's where the diversity comes uh, from so many wonderful small businesses. Small businesses that never imagined that they would having, be having the success now that they have and having that plethora of solutions. In the technology world, it's the same for applications. I would bet most of us here in, in this room have probably between 30 to 40 applications on your smartphone. At times, I know I go through and I go, why did I load this? You know, I did go ahead and do it. There's a software development company out there that started as a small business that developed that and now is marketing out mm -hmm. there. And I think that's where it's our responsibility, both on the technology side and then also uh, on the um, smaller with physical goods, to have that broad range of diversity as an economic stimulus for countries. I think we, we have uh, time for a couple of questions from the audience, actually. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to identify yourself before you ask the question, but please go ahead, sir. Um, I'm Gilberto Marin from Mexico. I'm very glad uh, you have again, like in Davos, this e-commerce conference. And I would like to have uh, three problems that, I mean, we operate in, we produce baby diapers and adult diapers, and we do e-commerce. But I would say that um, some of the main problems, very specific in Mexico and in Brazil, I think number one is the safety. What I mean is because in, for instance, the United States, you can leave a case outside of your house and people will receive it and mm -hmm. you will get it. In Mexico, unfortunately, it <laughs> doesn't happen always, no? It's uh, even in Brazil, too. Uh, so, so, so security is a problem. Uh, uh, the, the second situation is the cost of the delivery. The cost of the delivery uh, in the United States is competitive. In Mexico, it's expensive. In Brazil, it's quite expensive. Of course, 
different. The dimension of the country is different, but, but I think the cost of the delivery, especially when you think like a, a package will cost 1,000 pesos, but if the transportation costs 200 pesos, then it's killed. Uh, and the other one is the, 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 the payments. The cost of payments, especially in Mexico and in Brazil for a small business, I'm not talking ourselves, but a small business, could be 4%. So if you put 12% or 13% on transportation, 4% on the uh, payment, so you already are, are almost at the margin that will take a Walmart or somebody like that. So I think those issues, uh, because the, the other ones you already mentioned, so that's my point. Any thoughts? Well, it's absolutely right. And uh, those are just uh, examples of the kind of uh, challenges that need to be addressed. Um, if you want to have a, a booming uh, uh, electronic commerce market, uh, giving opportunities for small and medium-sized uh, companies, uh, those issues have to be handled. Um, cost, of the cost of delivery is a big one. Um, for a big company, uh, they, they ship thousands of packages and they, they have the, the room to negotiate uh, with delivery companies as lower costs and things like that. But if you are actually shipping one, two, three, four packages, the costs can be higher than the product itself many times. Uh, and that, of course, uh, uh, blocks the, the ability of those companies to, to, to thrive. Um, we have in the WTO been discussing those things with logistics companies as well. So what we're trying to do is get the logistic companies, so uh, UPS, DHL, FedEx, etc., and, and have a conversation. What what could be made? Uh, how how can you make it simpler? How can you make it more effective? How can you make, for example, one issue that you did not mention is consumer trust. How, how, how do you improve consumer trust in the system? How does he know that he's going to have the package in time and that he's go it's going to cost what he thought it was going to cost? Because sometimes you buy something from a, a different man and, and, and the company says it's going to cost you 100 whatever, reais, dollars, etc. But when you get the bill, it's much higher than that because then you add taxes, you add duties, you add whatever taxes they want and fees. At the end of the day, the consumer doesn't know how much he's going to be paying. So all those things are doable. And I think that companies uh, like Amazon and others can help governments understand better how to improve the, 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 these uh, infrastructural challenges that we have. Hey, Matthew, let's, uh, I think it's, uh, we'll probably won't, won't have time for one more question, but I think we can expand uh, on, on yours. So what about this issue of the cost of, uh, of payments, right? I mean, is there a way out, you know, you, know, you have uh, obviously the big, uh, you know, big sellers obviously will have volume discounts, etc. but uh, is there a way to, you know, lower the cost for, for a small artisan? So the, the, the example that I gave earlier, this um, QR code based payment system that uh, the Argentine government just recently approved is a great example of how we're working to use innovation to reduce costs, particularly for small and medium sized enterprises, um, where you don't have to make the, the sunk cost investment in something like a POS terminal um, that, that can be very pricey, um, particularly now um, as they become more and more sophisticated. Now, you know, if you're a small and medium sized business, you can just, you really, you just use your phone um, and the, the buyer uses his or her phone and that's how you make the, you, you can make the sale. You can have, you can paste the QR code onto your store wherever you are um, and that will dramatically reduce, that is one of the ways that, that we're working to reduce cost. Another way, which is also very interesting is um, we have, in, in recent years completely opened up our network um, so that developers can come and basically play in sort of the visa sandbox and develop new products um, that can help improve the whole payment experience for small and medium sized enterprises. So there's a lot of work that we're doing where we're using data, where we're using innovation um, to help come up with things or enable others to come up with things that make the payment experience so much more seamless and easy, um, particularly for small and medium-sized merchants. Jeff, the, the best for last. Now, what about, uh, when I think of 
cities like Mexico City, where I think of the logistics involved in Brazil, which has continental size. You know, what yeah. do we do about you know the, the cost of uh, of delivery? Well, <clears throat> there's a I couple mean, of things, and we actually do business in Mexico <laughs> City, so it's a great example uh, of those. Um, we're working on a number of things. One is absolutely working with government to streamline the operations for how just goods come into and out of the country, uh, and just that operational side. And so that's one that we proactively work both at a policy level as well as at the fundamental operational level so that goods can go ahead and flow cross borders or with, even within the organizations. On the logistics side as well, just given the volume by which we go ahead and, mm -hmm. and ship every year, we work with all the suppliers you just mentioned uh, as well as governments. Um, for instance, the Mexican Post, uh, US Postal, Canadian Post, Singapore Post, other ones, um, to really help them optimize uh, their process, to look at what's the technology that they're using to go ahead and streamline their operational costs. Because if we're able to go ahead and reduce all these you know, pesos <coughs> to dollars, to raise, et cetera, all along the line, we find very few customers like to overpay for what they're buying. And so let's provide that back to the small business uh, that is there. On the security side, you mentioned just as a quick note, um, you referenced the US. I still think we have some room in the US to work on this one too, uh, as well. One thing we did start piloting, which is rather exciting, um, are Amazon lockers. Um, and from that, uh, it was predominantly in the university system initially, where some of the suppliers you mentioned were delivering lots of packages to dorms that were disappearing uh, on students' doorsteps. Um, so in listening to both the customer as well as the end customers, the suppliers, but also many of the transportation partners that we work with, we came up with this idea of lockers. We're at the Central Union uh, on a campus. There's a, a row full of lockers. They're bright orange. And UPS, FedEx, some of the others, that go ahead and they, they deliver all the packages to one place. And then the recipient gets a code that gets emailed to them. They go to the locker, they open, they punch in the code, opens the door, out comes the package. Close the door, off they go as a part of it. Uh, we're continuing to pilot this on the security side to go ahead and make sure the packages arrive. These are some of the ideas that we're working on. We've got a lot more that our customers are asking, and they'll help to continue to guide us on that one. Thank you. I think we are out of time unless our organizers allow us one more question. We can go. Okay, I think there's a gentleman in the back. Uh, Antonio Calcanhoto, Unilever, yeah. Brazil. I think it's much more for Azevedo. You talked a little bit about <laughs> regulatory is a dream, for, even for us in Mercosul. But uh, how you see the non uh, tariff barriers and the tariff barriers? What is uh, the WTO is thinking about this e commerce thing? Well, we, we are now having um, groups of countries, like I said, just today, there was a, an open-ended meeting in the WTO with more than 80 delegations uh, inside the room. Uh, what they're trying to do now is to develop uh, an agenda. So what, which are, for example, the regulatory issues that need to be addressed? For example, um, well, consumer protection, uh, identification of fraud, uh, customs cooperation, uh, facilitation for uh, e-commerce transactions at the border, um, return of merchandises, uh, payments, uh, electronic payments, um, electronic signatures. There is a host, uh, there, there's, a, there's a big list of things that can be done uh, to harmonize and facilitate and reduce costs of the transactions. The whole rationale is that the more harmonized, the more streamlined, the, 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 the lower the costs, the more people will participate. The easier it's going to be to have an inclusive environment where uh, the small players are going to benefit uh, from this. Even in agriculture, you know, rural communities that can have all of a sudden information and direct contact uh, with, the, with the buyer uh, of his product instead of relying on the middleman who usually makes the money uh, and pays very poor, uh, very low prices to the producer. So there is a, a lot of applications that we can develop. I think that's the kind of conversation that is beginning to happen there. And I invite all of you uh, who have ideas, who want, I have identified issues that could be dealt uh, at the multilateral level 
to send those ideas to us. We, we often uh, have uh, dialogues with, uh, with different companies, with uh, the private sector. We have the trade dialogues in the WTO, which is precisely to, to identify uh, companies that are interested in having this conversation with us. Uh, don't hesitate to, um, to knock on the door. It's in Geneva, by the lake. It's not that bad a place. So uh, you're all invited to come in and, uh, and share with us your views and ideas. Yeah, we didn't talk about the cost of lodging, right? But, uh, <laughs> that's one more. You had a question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> hello. Uh, hello. Okay. hello. Uh, my name is Wagner and I'm Brazilian and I work for a global online travel agency. And I see that Europe and United States, the online intermediaries, they are not totally responsible for the products and service they sell online. In Latin, we have a different principle. In general, the intermediaries, when sell a product or a service, they have joint and several liability about the product that's being sold. Do you see that this trend to protect a lot the consumers can be a problem to the development of the e-commerce in the region, especially in Brazil and Argentina, considering the right of regret, and putting a lot of pressure and responsibility, I mean legal responsibility in the company. Because on the side effect, maybe thousands of legal claims are against online intermediary. And I see this trend just in Latin, not in other parts of the world. And how would you see that this very protect, protective sets of law in Latin? Well, we, we, we are dealing with that, that under the, the, the chapter of consumer protection. Um, but that includes several things, including legal liability. Uh, when you are doing these things cross-border, which legislation applies? Uh, you know, e-commerce uh, did something which m most people don't realize, which is you removed uh, a link of the chain. Uh, especially if you're, if you're talking about uh, a, a business-to-consumer transaction. Um, in the past, you had an importer. So if there was a problem in the, in the provision of the services or of the goods, you knew who, who you could go to or who you had to go to. It was the importer. He was the one liable to deliver the product or service that he was offering. With the direct transaction between business and consumer, that link disappeared. Completely. So it's now somebody at this side of the border dealing with somebody at the other side of the border. And really, at the end of the day, you have no concrete international regulation deciding what the responsibilities are. And I think that your experience, what you just said, is something very valuable because that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to be looking at. Um, if you go too, too far in one direction of, prov of providing full comfort, uh, to the consumer, you may be introducing uh, difficulties and, and, and rigidities for the, for the services or, or goods provider. And if you go in the, the other direction, you are also going to be hampering the development of e-commerce because the consumer is not going to trust the system. Um, and that, I think, is the kind of conversation that we're beginning to have. The experiences that you just shared with us is very good. And I hope that uh, we can have more of that kind of input in these conversations. Thank you. I think now we've really run out of time. Uh, I would really like to thank our panelists for such uh, insightful discussion and, and, and you in the audience as well. Okay. Thank Good night. You thank you. Thank you very much.